Um, I'd like to present my joint work with uh, Lindsay Cameron and uh, Tawana Dillahunt, both from the U University of Michigan. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by um, sort of uh, stating our motivations and grounding our research. Um, as many of you might be aware, uh, ever since the economic downturn, uh, Detroit City has been confronted with several challenges. Uh, this includes uh, white flight, racially segregated neighborhoods, uh, high unemployment rates, and poverty. This has subsequently resulted in a collapse of the city's transportation infrastructure. Um, Detroit City has reduced or eliminated much of its bus services, and a large percentage of the city's population don't have access to cars. In fact, one of the popular stories that made the press uh, was that of James Robertson, uh, the man in the picture, who walked 21 miles to work and back every day uh, simply because he had no access to any form of transportation. Past research has examined some of the barriers to getting ahead, specifically in the context of people who are low SES, uh, socioeconomic status, in Detroit City. And uh, suggest that there are many barriers, but two relevant barriers for us were the limited access to transportation uh, and transportation infrastructures, and the limited access to strong networks. In a study we published at CHI last year, we looked at the first of these um, and asked if real-time ride-sharing services uh, can address some of the transportation barriers uh, in the context of Detroit City. Um, we found that uh, these services have pros and cons, but one of the major benefits, as cited by our participants, was the opportunities it afforded uh, for rich social interactions with drivers which consequently piqued our interest in the second of the barriers, which is the limited access to social networks. As many of you might be aware, social capital primarily refers to the benefits that people gain from their social networks. Cultural capital, on the other hand, refers to the forms of skill, education, and knowledge that result in an understanding of cultural meaning and references. We were specifically interested in a form of cultural capital called embodied cultural capital, which can be acquired both consciously and passively through a process of socialization. Social and cultural capital have both tangible and intangible benefits. Social capital and cultural capital can be transformed into economic capital. And some of the intangible benefits of social capital include access to information and resources like job opportunities. In fact, uh, social capital has been understood in the context of transportation previously. Uh, past research has emphasized on the importance of public transportation uh, to fostering social capital by not only allowing access to wider networks of people, but also underlying its importance uh, for socially excluded populations uh, in affording opportunities for socialization via shared social spaces. For our research study, we used a theoretical frame of social resources, which argues that at an individual level, social capital can be understood through four forms of social resources, which include informational resources, which is the provision of useful information or suggestions often to the effect of problem solving, instrumental resources, which refers to the direct and tangible ways in which people assist each other, Emotional resources, which refers to uh, concern, empathy, love, care, and encouragement that people offer one another. And social companionship, which primarily refers to the social time that people spend with one another that gives them a sense of belonging. Consequently, for our research study, we ask the following research questions. First, we ask, what benefits did passengers and drivers gain from their social interactions? and whether these social interactions and these benefits are opportunities for the development of social and cultural capital. We also ask what opportunities exist for technologies to enhance some of these interactions between passengers and drivers, specifically in the context of real-time ride-sharing services. To answer these research questions, we combined results from two qualitative studies 
one with passengers and one with drivers. We recruited 13 passengers and 13 drivers through a, combi through a combination of offline and online sources. Passengers were between the ages of 20 and 52, while drivers were between the ages of 21 and 59. A majority of the passengers were unemployed and eight of the 13 drivers worked full time. A large percentage of both passengers and drivers were African American. We conducted semi-structured interviews with both passengers and drivers, which lasted between 45 and 80 minutes. And in addition, uh, with the passengers, we conducted a diary study. Uh, specifically, passengers were given a $75 Uber credit, uh, during which time they were asked to maintain a journal or a diary where they jotted down any interactions they had with their drivers. Both the interviews and the diaries uh, were analyzed through uh, an inductive process. We developed provisional codes for the four forms of social resources and any references to cultural capital. Uh, I will now present my findings from the study, uh, begin with the passenger phase and uh, move on to the driver phase. Um, passengers reported on rich social interactions with their drivers and uh, told us about how many drivers were very eager to share with them information about the city of Detroit and some specific local spots in the city. Additionally, some interviewees like Rosalind here also mentioned how their Uber drivers told them, uh, gave them information about how one could become an Uber driver. Uh, let us recall that a large number of our participants were unemployed and viewed Uber as a source of em employment, which probably emphasized uh, the importance of this piece of information. Some other participants also reported on getting emotional support from their drivers. Um, take the case of Dale, who said, um, he asked me when he took me to Target, did I work there? And I told him that I was trying to get a job there. And he said, if I have my license, that Wayne County downtown was doing hiring for part-time cleanup and janitorial stuff. Most of them were nice, but he made me feel comfortable and talked to me and gave me encouragement not to stop looking for work. Like Dale, other people were on the lookout for jobs as well and spoke about how in the course and during the course of an Uber ride, they received support from their drivers um, to keep with the job hunt process. Uh, similarly, the drivers too uh, reported on uh, a multitude of interactions with many passengers. Uh, but additionally, in the case of drivers, they also acquired informational resources from other drivers in the Uber network. Um, the kinds of information that, was, that were going around primarily via social networks included that about search pricing locations, uh, areas prone to ticketing, and Uber rules and regulations. Yeah. Drivers also provided uh, direct tangible assistance to passengers and vice versa. Uh, some drivers uh, printed out business cards which they handed out to passengers during the course of an Uber ride. Uh, this primarily allowed passengers to call drivers up outside the Uber network and uh, tip them for uh, their service, a feature that wasn't available through uh, the Uber application at the time of our research project. Some of these drivers also developed friendships with some of their passengers, uh, which extended to well beyond the Uber ride. Uh, take the case of Marlon here, uh, who met an energy consultant on one of his rides and uh, kept meeting him outside uh, uh, to get advice about uh, job hunting and such. As he says, um, uh, this, this particular gentleman uh, became uh, a life coach of some sort. Subsequently, we ask, uh, based on our findings, uh, what opportunities exist for uh, technologies to leverage uh, uh, some of these interactions, I mean, uh, some of our findings, and enhance some of these interactions between drivers and passengers, specifically in the context of uh, real-time ride-sharing services. Uh, first, we find that uh, many of the interactions between passengers and drivers uh, centered around location and uh, consequently we ask whether uh, systems like GPS can uh, leverage location to provide location-based inferences. Um, specifically, we recommend that these systems nudge drivers to providing informational resources and instrumental help when necessary. 
Uh, for instance, drivers who are picking passengers up uh, from a grocery store could be nudged to provide assistance with packages or groceries, which uh, many of our passengers really appreciated. Um, Automotive interfaces are designed keeping in mind drivers and uh, helping them assist with their jobs, uh, fundamentally tasks like navigation. Um, but we find that drivers sought other pieces of information to help with their jobs. Now, they often uh, interacted with other drivers uh, to find out information about search pricing locations, uh, about areas prone to ticketing, etc. Um, we ask if uh, Automotive interfaces in the context of real-time ride-sharing services can actually enhance and support some of these driver-driver interactions. Also, both drivers and passengers had several needs uh, which they disclosed to each other during the course of an Uber ride, and we believe that automotive interfaces can help in the disclosing of these needs as well. Finally, um, we also note that drivers were going well and beyond uh, their duty of moving passengers from point A to point B and performing additional labor, uh, whether it be with helping with packages or providing additional resources. We ask if some of this additional labor can actually be incentivized. Um, past research uh, has emphasized that ratings don't necessarily work for drivers, primarily because passengers don't understand the impact they have on the driver's livelihood. Uh, we propose uh, uh, interface recommendations like badges, which has since been implemented by Uber, as additional ways in which drivers can be uh, incentivized for some of their work. In conclusion, um, we extend past findings, uh, which uh, uh, <coughs> extends, we extend past findings, which uh, speak about public transportation as being vital for uh, the development of uh, social capital and say that real-time ride-sharing services also have opportunities for the development of social and cultural capital. Um, through, uh, uh, this is primarily achieved through the acquisition of informational, emotional, and instrumental resources and companionship. Uh, we also explore ways um, in uh, we also explore ways uh, in which technology can enhance some of these interactions between riders and drivers. Um, overarchingly, uh, in academia, um, uh, Uber services like Uber and Lyft, uh, the sharing economy, has come in for a great deal of criticism, and rightly so. Uh, but we do believe that these services have certain benefits, especially for the kinds of populations that we were uh, dealing with in our study. Uh, with that, uh, I'll leave the floor open to any questions. We have time for several I'll start us off if no one has a question formulated yet. Um, so it strikes me that uh, ride shares a great deal of trust mm -hmm. is needed. Um, did your participants talk at all about the, the trust in the kind of resources that were being shared, or you, you mentioned that several had formed these kind of lasting um, relationships beyond just this initial kind of exchange. Um, so yeah, if you could just kind of comment on if that came up in your data. Uh, let me try paraphrasing that. So you were wondering if uh, some, uh, I mean, what are some of the trust aspects to the information which was kind of being exchanged between riders and drivers, whether there was a trust angle to it at all? Right. Well, did anyone in, in your inner, your discussions with them bring up issues of trust or whether they just kind of took the resources and things that were being given to them on face value? Right. Um, we didn't explore the concept in great detail, but I can tell you that trust did pop up uh, in a much broader context, both with riders and passengers. For instance, uh, um, drivers were often being asked to venture into neighborhoods that they didn't know much about, in which case trust with regard to the safety of the, of the neighborhood became a, uh, was, a, was a big theme that popped up. Um, so with regard to our data, trust not so much, but in a broader context, uh, yes, we did, uh, uh, we did find certain themes of trust with both passengers and drivers. Any other questions? All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, speaker.